Over £40 million has been lost to purchase scams this year. As BBC's B Scam Safe Week continues, Matt Aura explains what they are and why you shouldn't use a bank transfer to pay for goods online. Plus, unbelievably, over 80% of sight loss is avoidable. BBC presenter Lucy Owen tells us how she almost lost her vision after being too busy for an eye checkup. And Cooker Von Cobbs making a delicious stuffed flatbread that costs less than a fiver to make. Hello, welcome to your Wednesday morning live. Uh, there was such a lovely tribute happening just down the road to us from the studio here in Old Trafford last night yeah. uh, for Sir Bobby Charlton, the legend that is Sir Bobby Charlton, World Cup winner, Man United uh, legend. You would have seen loads of lovely comments coming through this morning on breakfast and a, a really big night there at yeah, Old Trafford. Yeah, so good to see so many people coming together. And I'm sure Sir Bobby would have been delighted. Man United winning in the Champions League, yeah. which is what it was all about. Absolutely. Him. He loved the club, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Ranj, Cook, Yvonne Cobb, Pascal, her interpreter, are all here this morning. Good morning, morning guys. Good morning. And Matt, you're here. We are on day three of our B Scam Safe Week. You're actually going to be talking about the fraudsters doing the rounds, trying to steal money from shoppers and people buying used cars online. Yeah, I mean, it's timely. I mean, uh, used I think. Cars. Yeah. That happened to me. Did it? I put a £700 deposit down on a car a few years ago, and then the website just completely went away. I was completely scammed. Yes. I thought it was so Bad. genuine. It just proves the point that everybody, there's a scam for everybody. It's what we've been saying all week so far and the response has been incredible. But it is so important to get that message out to people by any means that we can that, you know, there is a scam for everybody. You might think you're safe, but you've still got to follow the rules. Yeah, well, totally. we've been out and about yesterday. Yes. Our finance expert, Ina Bain, and presenter Riyad Khalif were in Dunstable. They, look, they were not messing around. They None. were running <laughs> around stopped. with all stickers. They were getting the stickers everywhere. This is all part of our Stick It to the Scammers campaign. Over 5,000 have been requested so far. I was actually in the office yesterday afternoon, getting the packages ready, sending them out, big pile there. Yep. I didn't see you, though, Gaff. I didn't see you there. <laughs> you were supposed to remind me. I had me a massive go, pile. Wait, you weren't there. It's supposed to be a partnership, that's all I'm saying. You Exa said you exactly. Were I was... Anyway. Awkward. Uh, it's... It's gone cold in the studio. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get your hands on some of those stickers, head to the B Scam Safe website at bbc.co.uk slash B Scam Safe. You're yeah, forgiven. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the idea is you pop them on your phone like this to remind you to stop, think before picking up. Uh, Everyone's got them. We're all waving our phones today. <laughs> Lost my phone. Where's your phone? <laughs> <laughs> Where's your phone, man? <laughs> uh, and in around 20 minutes, Scam Interceptor's Nick Stapleton is going to be explaining uh, how joining a do not call register can also help you tell if there's a criminal on the other end of the line. Really useful advice there, actually. All that coming up. Plus at 9.45, Steve and Lucia from BBC's award-winning The Repair Shop will be joining us. Uh, uh, you know, Steve always wears two pairs of glasses. Yeah. Does anyone know why he does this? No, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to find yeah. out. I'll be asking that. And, of course, we'll be getting their top tips too, including why pictures shouldn't be hung by a radiator. And that's mm. not just the masterpieces, but all kinds of different things, like your kids' artwork, yeah. for example. Yeah. Uh, and to finish off the show, in style, Strictly choreographer Maria Tiaziani is teaching us some spectacular moves. This week for Strictly Fitness, what have you got in store? Well, we have a very special day today because we have a clip from our very oh, own Dr. Raj. Look at the state <laughs> of him. Of course, with Jeanette <laughs> and the theme, obviously, Monster Under the Bed. <laughs> so that, that, is amazing. Is the, that is the move that we will be doing right there. That's what they do on Strictly. If you can't dance, they give you an outfit to hide it. <laughs> all that coming up. But before that, all week, we're doing our best to tackle scams. Brand new figures released just this morning show how much the criminals are making. Matt, you have those stats, that yeah. data. And they really are shocking. This comes from uh, the banking body UK Finance. Um, it, it puts this, the scores on the doors, really, and tells us what we're dealing with. £580 million uh, was lost through fraud in the first half of the, of the year 
230 million lost to authorised push payment fraud. Um, and the, the number of cases increased by 22%. So grim reading mm. all round. But authorised push payment is one of those terms, actually, we should find a better word for it, because it's very simple. Scammers tricking you into thinking you're sending money to someone you, you know or trust or, or, or owe money to. And, in fact, it just ends up in their pockets. There's so much of it about. There are so many different types of it as well. And like I said, you know, there is one for pretty much everybody. Everyone, exactly. Yeah. In fact, Yvonne, you've been involved in one of these types of scams, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. It happened about 10 years ago that I was cloned on social media. Somebody pretended to be me, asked for money, and then a friend had sent me a text asking if I'd received the money, but of course it wasn't anything I'd requested. So we realised that was part of a scam, and I know that I worry about deaf people in the community who may be vulnerable to being targeted to these kind of scams because often English is their second language, but I know mm. charities are there to support the deaf community. But, yeah, yeah scary. That's a good point. Yeah. Really, that's I so mean, common, these impersonation scams. Yeah, it is an impersonation scam, one type of uh, authorised uh, push payment fraud, but actually they're going so much more sophisticated as well. Tonight on Watchdog, my friend Nikki Fox, she's going to be making a film, putting a film out which talks about AI and how that can even impersonate someone's voice, which is one of those things you'd use as verification. You'd think, well, yes. that sounds just like them, but this is how convincing it can be. Hi, I'm Stephen. I fully authorised Nikki to use my credit card to buy us all dinner. My goodness. That's actually, that's it's getting scary now. But that's the thing, though, that sometimes, you know, that's all you need is a snippet like that, isn't it? Authorising someone to use your card. That is proper terrifying. Wow. Wow. OK, so we'll see that whole film on The One Show at 7pm uh, tonight on BBC One. Uh, the thing is, it's not just happening online either. It's happening quite a lot with phone calls. Yeah, and again, the way the, the figures break down is absolutely fascinating. 45% of the total amount lost in the first half of this year was to scams that originated on phones. That's calls, text, WhatsApp, that sort of thing, compared to 32% online, 11% via email. Interestingly, you have maybe uh, fewer scams with the phone, but they take more money because they can hit, hook you in for longer rather than purchase scams, which is a one-off, and then it's kind of, once you've worked it out, yeah. then that's the end of the scam. Later on in the show, we're going to be hearing from Nick, yeah. uh, Nick Stapleton from Scam Interceptors. He's got some top tips on how to stay safe when you're using your phone. Yeah, always good to remind us of the tips. Um, lots of people have been getting in touch, uh, Matt, saying that they've been infected by purchase scams. In fact, Teresa said she saw an advert for reduced price sheds to house her mobility scooter on social media, so she paid for one, but it never arrived and they just gave her excuses over email. How can people avoid falling for this type of scam? It's so important to be aware of this coming up to Christmas as well, where there are things that you need or want for your family, you've got to make sure they're actually there. One of the things I would say, do not make a decision based on price alone. That's one of the key things to say, because sometimes you might see it slightly cheaper. That's not an indication that it's any better. Don't believe it if it's too good to be true, the old classic. Um, if you are asked to pay outside of the established recommended way of paying, that's another red flag. Bank transfers, classic. Um, if it's an online auction, they will have their own payment method. Go with that. Reverse image search, something we've talked about before. Take the advertised image and then feed it through Google's own reverse image search. That will show you where else... I mean, look, that's dodgy. Look at that lot <laughs> for a start. That will show you where else it's been used. And then you can say, well, hold on, this is not in someone's back garden. It's being yeah. used a number of times in different places. It's a really good tool to use as well. The other thing um, to say is... Pay by credit card if you can. Section 75 covers you between £100 and £30,000 for that. Also, if something doesn't turn up, don't fall into that trick of being persuaded to pay again mm. because your payment hasn't gone through. Mm. That's literally sending good money after bad. Definitely to be avoided. There's loads more advice like mm. this on the Be Scam Safe website, which is part of the BBC's website as well. It's and all there. Talking about purchase scams, I guess one of the biggest purchases you can actually make is a car, and yeah. you've been investigating how fraudsters are targeting people who are trying to buy used cars online. Because you? it's becoming so common as well. People are buying cars that way a lot. Um, the problem is that you can end up putting down the deposit and then waiting, only to find there never was a car there in the first place. Have a look. The second-hand car market is booming with new car production still delayed by a shortage in computer chips and a reduction in car production during the pandemic, 
more people are buying pre-loved. And finding those well-loved wheels is easier than ever. You know what gets me really excited, what really gets my motor running? That is finding a deal for a car online. And I'm not alone, because more of us are leaving dealerships in the rear view mirror and looking for our cars online. Makes sense. Don't have to go anywhere. Facebook, eBay, Gumtree, they're all filled with second-hand cars for sale directly from private sellers. With so many people shopping, prices are up 30% in the last four years. And where the money goes, scammers follow. Scams involving vehicles or their accessories are now the most commonly reported online shopping scams in the UK. Vulu was in the market for a new motor last year and turned to Facebook Marketplace. It was just a box standard picture of a car which seemed to have good mileage. So I reached out to the seller and his response was, sorry, the car is pretty much gone. Someone is coming to view the car. But the next day, Vulu was contacted again by the seller. He reached out to me and he kind of like hinted that the car was still available and that he's still waiting on the other person to come and see it. And if I put in a deposit, that will show him that I'm, I'm serious. So I sent him the £250. He acknowledged that he received the money and he intimated that he will be travelling down with the car like the following day. Vulu took the next day off work, ready to receive his newly secured set of wheels, but the car failed to appear. So he messaged the seller again. And I told him I've taken a Friday off as well to try and make things more convenient for him to deliver the car. And he didn't respond. I might have sent one more message. And when he didn't respond to that as well, I think the penny dropped that I've been scammed. It's not just Vulu. Car and van buying scams went up 74% last year, year on year. And the thing is, it's not just your money that's at risk. It could be your safety as well. Christine, not her real name, had a recent run-in that scared her so much that even though she never met the scammers face to face, she asked us to protect her identity. In August, she was interested in buying a car she'd seen as a classified ad on eBay. Her words here are spoken by an actor. Well, I thought it was quite reasonable and also very low mileage. I'd done an HPI check on it that came back. The mileage corresponded with what it was listed as. There was no finance, there was no adverse history. So I thought, yeah, it's a good car. So I contacted them via eBay and they said, yeah, I can send you a video of the car. Would you like to come and see it? He was saying, well, I've got other people interested. You can pay a deposit if you send the money now or you're not going to be able to keep the car because there's other people coming. So there was a level of pressure, yeah. Keen to secure the car, Christine agreed to pay a deposit of £900. She then spent a further £270 on travel and accommodation to go and collect the vehicle, as the garage was on the other side of the country. But when she got there, she was horrified to find out it was all a scam. When we got to the site, there were a couple of garages there, so we went in and asked, and they said they'd had many people turn up in the past couple of weeks with the same sort of situation. They'd sent a deposit, or they'd sent the full money. Christine called the supposed seller. They quickly blocked her number. So she called from a friend's phone. The seller then called back. He rang me and he said, look, I don't know why you're so upset. Your car's here. You're just being stupid. I said, there's no car. And he said, look. And he used my name and he said, don't forget, I know where you live. So you need to keep your mouth shut. And then he put the phone down. And I felt really used, really violated. What I've gone through, it's real stress and it's real hassle. And actually, I'm now just another statistic. This is massive. Don't send deposits. Threatening behaviour like that should be a clear-cut indication that you're dealing with a rogue. It may sound shocking, but the reality is 
it does happen. It's a story that's very familiar to journalist James Baggett from Car Dealer magazine. He's trying to stop the scammers, but it's an uphill struggle. These sorts of scams are on an industrial scale. We've done a lot of work trying to get these people shut down, but it's like whack-a-mole. As soon as you shut one down, they start up another business. There's been scams where websites are set up to clone other car dealerships. There have been fake car dealership websites that look completely genuine. And there have been some that have pretended to be a dealer on, on a social media platform. My advice would be always to do your research on these dealers. Genuine dealers will have lots of reviews on sites like Google, on Autotrader, on eBay Motors, and you can check out whether they are legitimate. If they haven't got any of their reviews, that is a red flag. So the big problem with these deposit scams is the scammers put in a matter of urgency uh, for the people that are looking to buy these cars. They really want them and try to convince them to hand over the money. You don't need to do that. And I would never send money to anybody, uh, any car dealership or anybody without seeing the car beforehand, physically, myself, in a dealership. One of the core tactics scammers use time and time again, online and in person, is applying pressure to hand over money quickly. Don't. Take your time before parting with your cash. Buying a car online can make perfect sense. There are genuine sellers out there and genuine bargains to be had. But if during the process you start to see those red flags appear, put the brakes on. Yeah, you're so right. Those purchase scams where the actual thing doesn't exist. Yes. I've been there, I did it. I paid money for something I thought was there. And, and it wasn't. It's horrible. It's horrible. And it's not just the actual experience of being in the moment and getting scammed. It's the impact that it has after right. that. People can be so fearful, yeah. like we just heard. It never leaves you. That's yeah. why we are doing our bit uh, this week uh, with scams. But next on the show, whether it's because of time or money, over 17.5 million people in the UK haven't had an eye test in the last two years. And shockingly, 80% of sight loss is preventable. Yeah, this is something BBC Wales presenter Lucy Owen found out when a trip to the opticians saved her sight. Well, Lucy joins us now along with Dr Ranj. Nice to see you, Lucy. Oh, yeah. lovely to see you too. Thanks so much for having me. Tell us more about what happened. So I've been getting these occasional white flashes in the corner of my eye. I'd be in the Wales Today studio and I, I'd, I'd just sort of see this little flash and I thought oh maybe it's the studio lights and it, it wasn't happening that often maybe just once or twice a day and it was over a period of a few weeks but I, I just didn't think there was mm. anything wrong with it I just thought it was just one of those things and then it so happened that I'd lost both my pairs of glasses brilliant I was never have I been more grateful for my carelessness um so I thought oh do you know what? I'll just pop to the opticians get a new pair of glasses and I'll just mention those white flashes that I've been having um, so sat down in the opticians, I was getting a check and I noticed that they were spending, you know, a little bit longer on this eye and um, literally the optician just said to me, right, um, I can see that your retina is starting to detach what and is. unless we act quickly, you could lose your sight. So I'm going to send you straight to the hospital, call somebody to drive you there, you can't drive um, and you can expect to be having surgery in the morning. So wow. I, I, I'd imagine you were hugely surprised at how serious this had become so so quickly. Oh my goodness, it was such a shock. You know, one minute I was shopping for a nice new pair of specs and the next minute I was, you know, on my way yeah. to hospital facing surgery and, you know, thinking about what it might be like to actually lose the vision in my eye. Everything was running through my mind. Would I still be able to work? Mm. What could it mean? Would I be OK? Um, so I went to the hospital. They realised that my retina was detaching slowly because apparently it can detach very quickly, which is why doctors need to act very quickly if they detect it. Um, mine was detaching slowly. They thought they might not have to operate, but a week later they, they realised that I needed it. Um, so I had the operation and um, it was quite a slow process to recover. Um, for the week after it, I had to sort of lie on my side um, and just kind of literally stay in that position the whole time. And then it took about three months for it to get back to normal. So it was quite a long process. A really long That's process. Seeing good health, my yeah. goodness. Such yeah. a frightening thing to, to have to go through. So you mentioned it involved a detached retina. Ranj, this is where you come in. What exactly yeah. is a detached retina? So the retina is a very thin layer of cells on the inside, at the back of the eye. It, it lines it, and that's what 
picks up the light and that's how we see. Um, sometimes because of changes in the jelly of the eye itself or a tear in that layer, that layer of that retina can start to detach away from the back of the eye and that's what causes problems. It's more likely to happen if you're short-sighted, if you've uh, had an eye operation or an eye injury or you've got a family history of retinal detachment but also it's more likely with age which mm -hmm. is why it's so important to be aware. Symptoms to look out for, similar to what you said, flashing lights. Um, also uh, floaters, lots of floaters inside the eye, a dark curtain or the feeling of a shadow um, and blurred vision. And if retinal detachment isn't treated properly, it can lead to a loss of sight completely in the eye. And Lucy, I'm sure you would echo this, especially after everything you've been through recently. Having those routine mm. eye appointments, just going to have that check is, is so important, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. And you just reminded me that I'm long overdue mine. Same. Ideally, if you can, try to have them annually. But 80% of sight loss is preventable and we can pick it up before it causes an issue. The NHS does estimate that 2 million people are living with sight loss in the UK. It's a huge issue. Um, eye tests can pick up things like short-sightedness, which we know increases your risk um, it's a window to other health conditions so especially if you've got things like glaucoma or diabetes it's really important to be getting regular checks but also there is some research that shows that we can pick up neurological conditions like Alzheimer's up to seven years before wow. you start to show any Gosh. symptoms at all wow. so they are vital yeah. uh, who's eligible for uh, a free eye test really good point. Um, so they are free in Scotland for everyone in England Wales and Northern Ireland they are free for under 16s and over 60s and for those with certain medical conditions. So we popped a very helpful guide on our website for people to do that. But like I said, if you can, try to get them every year. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, you would probably echo that as well now, wouldn't you? Oh, my goodness. I'm one of those people that kind of left my eyes. I didn't get them checked, even though I've been wearing contact lenses since about the age of 16. Mm. I will never be doing that no. again, and I would definitely urge people to get their eyes And actually, since you've been checked. talking about it, Lots of people are now. This is the whole point of doing this, isn't it? People are thinking, my goodness, it could happen to me. Do you know what? Yes, I, I wrote a report for BBC News Online um, about this, and I had so many people get back in touch with me afterwards. Lots of people saying, I'm going to book an eye test. Some people saying, do you know what? I recognise those symptoms. I had floaters in my eyes. I had flashes too. I went to the opticians. I was referred for surgery. So, you know, please do make that, that yeah. trip to the opticians if you notice any sudden changes in your eyesight because it could, It really you know, does make you think. And, and you're doing your well now, everything's... I'm all yeah. good, thank you so much. Yes, back uh, yes, yeah. back to work, which is amazing. Been uh, presenting back again for about another month now and um, I will need another operation because yeah. this surgery uh, makes your eye develop a cataract so I'm going to have to have that operation in about a year or two years perhaps but I am just incredibly grateful that I went to the opticians that day because I can see you today. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good to hear. Good, good, good Thank health you so again. Much. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, now, as Matt was saying earlier, scam phone calls are a massive way fraudsters pick their targets. Most people are used to the annoying and sometimes even scary calls, but it's hard to know the right way to deal with them. So, scam interceptors Nick Stapleton has essential advice to help identify a criminal on the other end of the line. 41 million people in the UK were targeted by phone scammers in summer 2022. And with an estimated 700,000 victims following the fraudster's instructions, that is an awful lot of people who could be left out of pocket. To keep our money safe from scammers, it's important to know what to look out for and, of course, what to do if you think you've got a fraudster on the phone. Tip number one. Don't respond to any unexpected calls or texts without checking first. If someone calls you out of the blue, Hello? it's best to hang up. And if you need to, call them back on a number you trust. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. I think this might be a scam. I'm gonna hang up and call the bank back on a number that I have for them. If the caller was claiming to be from your bank, you can call them back using the number on the back of your card. Or if you're worried, you can connect securely to most major UK banks by dialing 159 and following the options. Your bank can then confirm if they do need to speak with you. And if you feel awkward about telling the person you're going to hang up, it's okay. We've specifically checked with most major UK banks and they are totally fine with you disconnecting the call and calling back. Tip two, stop and get a second opinion. Legitimate companies will always be happy for you to hang up and speak with someone you trust. But if you say you're going to hang up and it's a scammer on the phone, 
They'll say whatever they can to keep you on the line. They might even become more aggressive, pushy or threatening. Do not let them intimidate you. It's a good idea to discuss what you're being told with a family member, friend or colleague to get their take on it. Scammers will say you don't have time to do this. Nothing is so urgent it needs to be done immediately. You've always got time to stop and assess the information that you're being given. Tip three, register with the Telephone Preference Service. The Telephone Preference Service, or TPS, is an official do not call register for landline and mobile numbers. It's illegal for organizations to make unsolicited sales and marketing calls to any number on the register. It only takes a couple of minutes to register, and once it's done, you can be pretty sure that anyone calling out of the blue is probably a scammer. It's important to report scam calls and texts. If you get a fraudulent call from someone claiming to represent a company, you can let the firm itself know. Suspicious texts can be forwarded to 7726. It's easy to remember as it spells spam on your keypad. Next time you receive a call or text out of the blue, don't be afraid to take control and stick it to the scammers. Yeah, we cannot reiterate the message enough. That's what we're talking about all week. We'll continue yeah. uh, to do so, to stop those scammers. Stop the scammers. Stick and it to the scammers. Stick it to the scammers. All, all the advice, hints, tips, everything you need is on our website. There it is, bbc.co.uk slash morning live and tomorrow Nick's going to share his tips to help you spot suspicious emails which is actually the most common way people get scammed. Mm. Uh, something positive happening online is a recipe that millions of people have been drooling over. Have a look at this. It's gone a bit viral. 10 million people Ten are having million? a go at these little flatbeds. Uh, Flatbread. Flat. <laughs> what did Flat you say? Beds. Flatbreads. And you can make them <laughs> and fix them in just minutes. Uh, Avon's making her version of these uh, today. They look absolutely uh, gorgeous. Range, don't lick the knife. That's absolutely <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> uh, these are them. They, they, they look. They look absolutely it delicious. Gets very excited. Very keen. <laughs> um, these are amazing, and I've, these are my version of it. But they're nice and cheap. It's five pounds to feed four people. It's nice and light lunch. It's nice and filling and they are delicious. But the main thing to say about the flatbread is it honestly only has two ingredients to it. So, and it's a similar concept they have in other countries. So when you think about in India, you have the aloo paratha. It's a very similar kind of idea. So it's a nice stuff. And same, similarly with balani from Afghanistan. So Ooh. it's that similar concept. So stuff flatbread. Different Simple, influences. easy, fun to make. They look fantastic well, but, but as well. does it. He's already had <laughs> Who's crap, into she, it nearly? We, we have made some that look absolutely yeah. uh, lovely. So that's, that's what great. we're going to OK, do where do we start, Yvonne, then? So I've already put the first ingredients in, so it's um, self-raising flour. I know some people are worried that it's difficult to make, but it genuinely isn't. So it's self-raising flour, because then it already has baking powder in it. And then Greek yogurt. And that's it for the flatbread? Yep, give it a stir for me, yep, that's it. Brilliant. So give keep stirring stir. it, and we will just add a pinch of salt. OK. So keep stirring for a few minutes, mix it together until you get that doughy consistency and it'll be nice and smooth like this. OK. Yep, I'm liking this. Okay. And cover with a wet towel so then you can maybe serve them up later in the evening. And then we cut into quarters and then let's roll one out. Here we go, Gethin, do you want to take one? Oh, yeah, And nice. you might want to just oh, pop a gone bit on of flour. On, We've gone... Are you a good roller, Gaston? Straight onto the surface. It's a nice texture. Yeah, uh, I didn't So you make it out. into a bowl first and foremost. Oh, made a mess. And then you can flatten it out. So I know that some people like to use a rolling pin. That's absolutely fine. So you can roll it flat. Or if you're camping or something, obviously just use the palm of your hand and flatten it out. Just like that. that nice looks good. and simple. Yeah. Stop laughing at me. <laughs> Stop <laughs> laughing at me. I think you're doing quite well, actually. So the aim is just kind of, so they're nice and flat, but probably about the, the height of a one pound coin. Flat bread, very good. OK, so we've got the flat bread and it can be fried up on its own or you can stuff it. So let's, let's, yeah, let's stuff filling. it. What's going in the stuffing? So let's kind of chuck them in and I'll explain what All they are. 
So we've got some mild chilli powder. We've got Cajun spices, and you can use any spices that you have and that you want to use. We've got some chopped up basil, Thank about you. handfuls, <laughs> nice fresh basil. All of it. Look at the teamwork. Oh, yeah, pop it all in. Yeah, chuck them in. We've got sun dried tomatoes, mozzarella cheese. Thank you. And it's lovely, nice and stringy, and it's a nice salty flavour. And if you prefer, then you could use feta cheese. And again, a bit of seasoning, pinch of salt and pepper. All of it. Uh, <laughs> not all of it. Pinch, a pinch of salt and pepper. Watch, um, watch how Michelle's head nods <laughs> as she stirs. She can't. She, she can't look. The head oh, goes. No, no. Yeah, the body language. I'm reading the body so language. Insane. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it. Okay, why is yours not flat, Gethin? Why is no, yours not flat, flat Gethin? <laughs> no one had noticed that until you mentioned it. No one noticed it's not it. It's a flat bread. It's a flat bread. Come on. Okay, so pop, pop some of the filling in the middle. So the aim is to put the filling in the middle and then just fold right. in the sides and then pinch the top so it's a little pouch. Oh, that's, that's probably right. a bit too so much. Check it. How long do you yeah. cook them for? About two minutes each, each side. All right, get them in. And I guess you could put all different types of stuff in. Yeah, that's it. OK, here we go. So give it a little twist at the top, sort of seal your parcel, and then turn it upside down, straight into the pan, fry it up. And now... Sauce. And let's do the dip as well. Let's kind of... Let's create the nice tzatziki dip. This is nice. It has cucumber with Greek uh, yoghurt. Cucumber. Cucumber, indeed. Cucumber. And Greek yogurt. Uh, natural yogurt um, might be the with rata, which would be more the Indian version. So the Greek yogurt's going in. A squeeze of lemon. And this is a really I've got a look at pro. Beautiful. Squeeze in the lemon. Seasoning. Love Seasoning. It. Yep, it's seasoning it with salt and pepper. And it combines really well with the flatbread with the the flavours. Here we go. Give that a step. There we go. That's fantastic. Right, ranch took in. He's been waiting the whole time. Again. <laughs> I believe it. <I'm... laughs> Tastes good. And you can put different fillings like you were mentioning earlier, Michelle. Chickpeas, mashed chickpeas, oh. anchovies, <laughs> capers. I mean, very flexible Can on I the flavours. I love Please it. yourself, enjoy it. Delicious, right? I'm good. Massey, I know you're doing a little fasting thing, but you can have these a bit later on. Save as soon as 12 o'clock comes, that's it, I'm tucking. Mm. There better be some left. That's all. Is that for me later? Oh, Save wow. that for you for later, Thank Matt. You. Mm. Oh. Nice. So good. I've oh, made yeah. a mess, but oh, no. it's absolutely I'll delicious. Wait. And don't forget, uh, you can find this recipe on the Morning Live website right now, along with loads of other uh, dishes, uh, all in alphabetical order. Easy to find for you. And while Yvonne is the perfect person to help add some sparkle to your meals when it comes to fixing prized possessions, you can always count on BBC's The Repair Shop. Oh, I'm saying more. I wouldn't have stopped yeah, eating if I knew yeah. that. Uh, the award-winning show is in its 11th series. That's difficult to say with a flatbread in your mouth. And uh, the treasures just keep on coming. Sorry. Mm. So, what have you brought us in? Well, something that my granddad made. Oh, fantastic. It's a lenticular. Sorry? Uh, is that what it's called? Yes. Yeah. What does that mean? A len lenticular. It's yeah. like a little optical illusion. The central picture yeah. is the three aspects of the one god. So that's Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Special piece that, isn't it? And Lucia, who you saw there with uh, Jay Blaines, joins us now with Steve. Everyone knows Steve. Everyone knows Steve's is a horologist as well. We know that because, look, the clock's in the background, Steve. Uh, Great lovely cue. to see you. Yeah, a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> yeah, and he's always on time. He's always on time. Um, <laughs> Lucia, that was, uh, as always on the repair shop, just a lovely story, but with a, a very, well, it's a very unique piece he had, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's quite an unusual piece. I'd seen one before because I spent a lot of time in India and I've come across those items. But, yeah, as soon as I saw it, I thought, wow, this is special. But it's always the story that, that gets you know the attention but for me the object itself it was an absolute delight and it was it's a very early optical illusion uh, which which is, which is called a lenticular that jay didn't even uh, know about no it's an unusual word they're called other things as well i think most people just refer to them as optical illusions um but uh, it, it, it's the way it's been put together and that it's quite simple actually but very um eye-catching let's say mm. yeah yeah this is, is the it thing was a about the piece. series though you learn so much you mm. kind of go back in history series 11 so far steve i mean you you must have some favorite repairs over the years 
I've got so many that, that I c couldn't name them all. Um, and uh, we keep on getting more and more interesting things that, that are quite taxing, taxing sometimes. Um, but that's what we quite like, um, as well as some fantastic stories that um, a lot of them are very emotional. And, and we all get really quite emotional in the barn as well. So uh, yeah. it's, it's very real. Oh, it's, it's just the best of television. Steve, what's the thing with the glasses? I mean, Comic Relief, you had about eight pairs on your head. You've always got at least two. Uh, what, what, what is that? What's, what's the story behind that? What's, what's going on? Um, well, um, I've, I've tried bifocals and very focals, and, and I just don't get on with them. So I just buy these uh, reader glasses. Um, they, these are number twos, and uh, I've... I, I usually have a pair of number threes, so if I need to look at something <laughs> nearer, I put those on. And then if I need to look at something even closer, oops, um, <laughs> um, I, I put both pairs on. I love um, it. And, uh, it works. And, uh, but I didn't know until um, the other day that uh, my dad used to do it as well. I found a photograph of him, and, and he's got two pairs of glasses, so I'm, I'm not the first to do it, and, and I'm sure lots of other people do it. Can, can I just say, though, that, that your, your um, last article about um, uh, eyesight uh, reminded me that I must go and have my there eyes tested. Mm -hmm. because, um, it, it, it just reminds me how important it is. Yeah, there absolutely. we go. Glad we could help, Steve. Um, Lucia, we've got to ask about tips. People that might have artwork, especially kids' artwork around the house, paintings, what would you say? How do you keep them at their best? Yeah, avoid direct light, like sunlight, for example. Avoid hanging them over radiators, open fires, because they just dry everything out. Paintings, your kids' drawings and works of art, they, they just get dried out. So avoid all that sort of uh, ways of hanging. Um, yeah, and it's really interesting you mentioned children's drawings because they're things that we all love and keep forever. You know, they're usually stuck on the fridge or on the wall in the entrance hall or somewhere for a while and then they're removed and new pla things take their place. But yeah, there we need to look at how, how we keep those as well. Because I was saying earlier um, to your uh, to Adam who called in that what, what I did with my nephews and nieces drawings that they sent me when they were kids, and they're all in their 20s and 30s now, I saved every single one. And I now give them back to them for birthdays and uh, just little gifts here and there. And when you see them, they're absolutely charming. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. charming. Good to know Adam, our research, has been working hard and briefing you before coming <laughs> yeah. on that uh, morning light. And uh, you're absolutely right, but some of my nephews, some of their paintings I may have chucked into the recycling <gasps> too. Anyway, uh, all the episodes of The Repair Shop uh, are available now on iPlayer. It's always lovely when The Repair Shop uh, jump in on Morning Live uh, to see us. Thanks, guys. Thank Brilliant you. work as always. Great. Take Thank care. You. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, and keeping memories alive is something that's important to many families. As part of Black History Month, the impact of black heritage and culture being celebrated is really important. In 1925, Jack Leslie was selected for the England football team, but it's thought he was later denied his place due to the colour of his skin. We look back at when we met his family and fans wanting to tell his story. <laughs> Sisters Leslie, Jill and Lynn are hoping to help revive a part of their own family story that had previously been erased from football history. Their granddad was Jack Leslie, a footballing legend who until recently had almost been forgotten. It's very emotional for us and it's fantastic that after virtually 100 years he is now going to be recognised as the fantastic footballer that he is. Jack was born in 1901 in London his mother was from Islington and his father was from Jamaica. As a child, Jack boxed and swam, but his great love was football and by his teenage years, he was playing professionally. At the time, he was the only black professional footballer in the country. He signed for Plymouth Argyle in 1921. Simon Hallett is the current chairman. Jack Leslie represented the club 400 times. He was one of the leading goal scorers in the entire football league at the time. So Jack is clearly one of the greatest players in our history. In 1925, Jack was given some thrilling news. He'd been selected to play for the national team. It would have made him England's first black player, but it wasn't to be. When he actually turned up at the training squad, he was asked to leave. This must have been a blow not just for Jack, but for the supporters and indeed for the whole city. Jack later said he believed it was because he was black. 
Shortly after the visit, Jack's name disappeared from the squad list and he never earned his England cap. He was a, a lovely man. He was, to us, he was very kind and patient, very loving. And it's difficult to put that into context with the man that must have gone out on the football pitch and been tough and hard, because that's not the side that we knew at all. Matt Tiller and Greg Foxsmith are lifelong Plymouth Argyle supporters, but they only recently found out about Jack. I felt like, why didn't I know about this? Why had I not heard about Jack Leslie and that injustice of the England call-up and then never getting his chance? My first thought when I heard about uh, the story of Jack Leslie was that we ought to do something about this to commemorate his achievements. Matt and Greg began a campaign to raise money to create a statue of Jack. And to create the statue, they chose Andy Edwards, a sculptor who's made bronze statues of people like Muhammad Ali and the Beatles. With the statue nearing completion, Andy's invited Jack's family for a private viewing. Smell who? Hiya. How are you? <gasps> that looks like him. You have got him. That is fantastic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you have caught him perfectly. People will, will come to this and say, that's Jack Lesley. Mm -hmm. It's going to represent you as a family. Don't start me again. <laughs> <laughs> the statue has since been cast in bronze and will be a lasting reminder of Jack's life and achievements. You know, I, I really think that's wonderful because it's just keeping his legacy going. Everybody that goes past that will be able to look at it and just learn a bit more about who he was and his history. Well know? done, Plymouth Argyle yeah. Football Club, for sure. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested in reading more about Jack's fascinating life and footballing story, Matt Tiller, who you saw in the film there, has just released a book. It's called The Lion Who Never Roared, and it's out now. An important story. Yeah. All right. Time for Strictly Fitness. Now, I think it? so. Shall we have a dance? <laughs> Come Cue on, music. Maria. Hi, Maria. Hello, hello. Let's get spooky, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have your costume? I'm wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good one. <laughs> this is what we're doing today. Oh, my goodness. Look yes. at Rand. Can you there. believe it? That so is good. actually Dr. Dr. Rand. And that is Jeanette. Yes. There we go. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> I think you should be here with me. We, we do it together. Yeah. <laughs> the first first exercise of the day that we have is hips together, uh, hands on the hips, you're distracting me, and we're going to do big, big circles just like this. Now, if you are seated down, hands up, and we're going to make big circles with the upper body. Excellent. Now, our second one is hand, fists up, and then we're going to twist to one side, twist to the other side. Good. And we're going to really engage the core here to get a good warm-up of those abs. And of course, our zombie, monster-inspired strictly move, arms up. Up. We're gonna go one, two, and one, two. You can add a little bit of a hop if you want, or you can just join me with the hands. That is absolutely fine. It's not like Ranch to build this part when it comes to dancing, <laughs> is it? Lovely. We've got a strictly choreographer in charge. What can go wrong? Take it away, Alan. With a midweek mid-body workout, hands on it's the hips. Maria Tiaziani. Yeah. 